Good morning, everyone. I am Neha Singh, PhD Scholar of Department of Biotechnology, DTU. Feel privileged to welcome Professor Praveer Kumar, HOD of our department, Dr. Yesha Hasija, Organizing Secretary and Convener of the Symposium, faculty members, guests, and all the participants to this one-day international e-symposium. This event has been planned to celebrate the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. The day focuses on the reality that science and gender equality are both vital for the achievement of international development. As said by the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, on this day, let's pledge to end the gender imbalance in science. With this thought, we embark upon the symposium and I request everyone to please rise for the national anthem. Thank you, everyone. The goddess Saraswati is the authority on academics and arts. Everybody from musicians to scientists pray to her for gratitude and knowledge. Today, we pray to her to receive her blessings with all humility, and we request to give us wisdom to make this world a better place. Now, we invoke the Almighty by lighting up the lamp by the dignitaries present with us. Please. Thank you, everyone. Science reflects the people who make it. The world needs science, and science needs women and girls. They have created life-saving medicines, done high-end research, and broken the sound barrier, explored the universe, and laid the foundation to understand the structure of DNA. They are inspiring models for our future generation. Today, we are celebrating International Day of Women and Girls in Science. I'm calling on everyone to smash stereotypes, defy gender biases, and defeat discrimination that hold women and girls back in the field of research. With this, I request Dr. Yesha Hasija, Associate Professor, Department of Biotechnology, Associate Dean, Alumni Affairs, Organizing Secretary, and Convener of this One Day International e Symposium, to please deliver the welcome address. Ma'am, please. Thank you, Neha. A very good morning, everyone. Professor Praveer Kumar, Head of Department of Biotechnology, Delhi Technological University, and the Chairman of the Symposium. Professor Jagopal Sharma, 
Professor B.D. Malhotra, other faculty members, Dr. Shilpa Madan, our first speaker for today, students, participants from India and across the globe. On behalf of the organizing committee, it is my great pleasure to extend a very warm welcome to all of you to this one day international e-symposium on women in science. In this radically changing, increasingly complex world, it's more important than ever that our nation's youth is prepared to be skilled to solve problems and make decisions. Skills that students develop in science, technology, engineering, and maths. Disciplines collectively known as STEM. Since time immemorial, women have overcome odds and challenged adversity. The determination that is intrinsic to womanhood has remained constant and stood the test of time. As the world moves forward, women are today leading the charge for a progressive society. This day allows us to not only recognize globally the achievements of women and girls who have dismantled gender stereotypes, leading innovation and groundbreaking research, but also promote the idea of STEM careers to future generations of women and educate men on their role in encouraging and mentoring women and girls in schools and workplace to pursue their technical and scientific passions. Delhi Technological University, being one of the top engineering institutes in the country, recognizes its role in shattering the gender disparities and thus promotes a conducive environment for female students and researchers, encouraging them to take up leadership roles in science. As a small initiative towards attaining gender parity, we celebrate today the women and girls who have forged a way for those of us in science by calling for actions to remove all barriers that hold us back. We have today in the symposium some of the very talented, very successful and awe-inspiring women from all over the world to reflect upon their experiences and show us the way forward. We have amongst us Professor Dr. Ingrid Fleming, Vascular Research Center, J.W. Goetz University, Frankfurt, Germany, Professor Daman Saluta, Director, Dr. Ambedkar Center for Biomedical Research, University of Delhi, Nidhi. Dr. Vidhu Sharma, Research Manager, Advanced Technology Platforms, the University of British Columbia. Dr. Gitanjali Yadav, Staff Scientist, NIPGR, Delhi, and Lecturer, University of Cambridge, United Kingdom. And of course, Dr. Shilpa Madan, Assistant Professor of Marketing, Virginia Tech, USA. Together, let's bridge the gap and celebrate the accomplishments of women in science. I wish you all a very inspiring symposium. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> Moving forward, we would like to present glimpses of Delhi Technological University. The lush green, green 170 acres, acres campus of Delhi Technological University welcomes, welcomes you all, the premier, premier engineering institution of Delhi, formerly known as, as Delhi, Delhi College, College of Engineering, is a, is a multi faculty institution of engineering and management. It has, it has mechanical, mechanical engineering, engineering electronics and communication engineering, electrical, electrical engineering, environmental, environmental engineering, civil, civil engineering, engineering, computer science engineering, information, information technology, technology, applied physics, applied, applied chemistry, applied, applied mathematics, biotechnology, biotechnology humanities, humanities Haley School, School, School of Management, University, University School, School of, School of management, management and Entrepreneurship at, at East, East Delhi campus. campus. The latest, the latest is Department of Design. Of design. And, with and with all this, this the 65 student societies wait, wait for you to broaden, to broaden your horizon with a with student, student strength, strength of more than, more than 10,000. Thank you, everyone. Now we present to you the highlights of Department of Biotechnology at Delhi Technological University.
Delhi Technological University has an illustrious history spanning over 79 years. This prestigious institution is well known throughout the world for its premier education, research and innovations. The Department of Biotechnology was founded in 2004 with a vision to make an impact through research and technology-based training. The department has more than 200 students enrolled in various UG and PG programs which encompass various basic and applied aspects of modern biotechnology. The faculty members of the department are excellent teachers and research scientists, and they have published their research in high-impact factor peer-reviewed journals. The department has made a profound impact in the field of biotechnology and life sciences with a cumulative citation index of over 20,000. We have received a cumulative research grant of over 6 crore rupees with various national and international collaborations with prominent institutions. The department houses 10 state-of-the-art laboratories, FIS, Environmental and Industrial Biotechnology Laboratory, Nanobioelectronics Laboratory, Molecular Neuroscience and Functional Genomics Laboratory, Complex Systems and Genome Informatics Laboratory, Immunotherapeutics Laboratory and Plant Biotechnology Laboratory. In 2018, the Honorable Vice Chancellor of DTU, Professor Yogesh Singh, inaugurated the world-class instrumentation facility in the department. The department organizes various events for promotion of academic research and collaboration. The department has organized multiple workshops, faculty development programs and conferences to foster research culture in the field of biotechnology and life sciences in India. All these events serve as a great platform for the students to gain research exposure. Many prominent speakers from all over the world have been invited in the past to deliver lectures to inspire the young scholars. The department takes various initiatives for the progression of its students. Starting from 2009, the department organizes its annual technical fest, Carry On, which features eminent speakers from academia and industries alike and witnesses participation from all over India. Students participate in social, cultural and leisure activities which facilitates developing various skills, competencies and foster holistic development. The students have won many laurels in both academics and extracurricular activities. Our alumni play an active role in contributing to the students' success and share their expertise and best practices in a given field. We have a strong alumni network, working in the world's top multinational companies and premier research institutions. The department strives to achieve the ultimate goal to prepare the future scientists and engineers who can address the diverse needs of the industry and can become the societal problem solvers. Thank you, everyone. So before moving to the next part of the event, we have few announcements for the participants. The attendance is mandatory for each session and link for the same will be available in the YouTube description and chat box during the lecture. There will be a feedback form towards the end of the last talk, which needs to be submitted for receiving the e-certificate. Please fill your names and email addresses carefully. We request you to post the queries, doubts of the lecture in the YouTube chat box. If the time permits, we would try to address most of our queries after the respective session is over. Thank you, everyone, for the cooperation. So for the second session, I would like to request Dr. Yesha Hasija to please introduce Dr. Gidanjali Yadav. Ma'am, please. Science for me gives a partial explanation for life. In so far as it goes, it is based on fact, experience, and experiment. These are the words by Rosalind Franklin, chemist, molecular biologist, and one of the key figures behind unlocking the structure of human DNA. So really, a lot is always yet to be explored. Our next speaker for today, Dr. Gitantli Yadav, is a lecturer at the University of Cambridge and a scientist at National Institute of Plant Genome Research, New Delhi. She's an expert in data science and complex networks with applications in food security and conservation. Dr. Yadav has received several awards, including the Hamid Fellowship from the University of Cambridge Exceptional Talent Award from the Royal Society of London, Insamital, IYBA, and SERB Women Excellence Award. She has a diverse educational background with a PhD in Immunology, a Master's degree in Biomedical Research, and a graduate degree in Botany from the University of Delhi, India. Dr. Yadav 
is a strong ad advocate for women in science and promotes science as a way of life to students in schools and colleges, especially from rural India. Over the past year, she has organized science camps for young school children, hands-on workshops for training Indian women in coding skills, R, and artificial intelligence. She is also a mentor for women in science at the British Ecological Society, as well as an ambassador for Indian young scientists at many international platforms. During the coronavirus pandemic, Dr. Yadav has been conducting a series of free online training programs in genomics and network biology under the name Protocols from Home in order to help students pick up vital skills in data science and make the best use of their time under this global lockdown. She's picked up a very interesting topic for today, women in science, a little sense of humor, and a big nose for data. I invite you, Dr. Gitanjali, to deliver your talk, please. Thank you, Yasha. Can everyone hear me? Yes, ma'am. Oh, great. So it's it's a great pleasure to be here, and um, uh, I look forward to to listening to other talks going on here. And I also think I know a lot of other speakers in the in in today's uh, lineup, and it's really nice to see one of them being a lady who I am going to talk about in my in my uh, you know small chat today. So let's uh, I'm going to try and share slides. Let's see if it if it works. OK. Can you see my my screen? Yes, ma'am, it's visible. Thank you. So. So, you know, for decades, all of you have possibly seen cave paintings, heard of cave, cave paintings, thought about early man, isn't it? For decades, even archaeologists assumed that the prehistoric cave paintings were the work of male hunters who used to, you know, who wanted to capture their dramatic feats. But a study revealed a hidden truth. One researcher at the Penn State University, and this was archaeologist Dean Snow, whose photo you are seeing over there, <laughs> he looked at the artist's signatures and the handprints stenciled on the walls, and he compared the relative lengths of the fingers to those of modern humans. And guess what he found? The data showed that 75% of all early cave paintings were by women. And this revelation is number one, of course, important for our understanding of prehistoric human culture and so on. A lot of scholars had assumed, and I would not say it, scholars who are archaeologists, even myself, as we grew up, we always talked about early man. We always knew about the cave paintings, and I always assumed it's 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 men who did it. You know, I would think there are very few people. Well, I know one friend of mine, Ganga, who would have thought it's a woman, woman but most of us do not think like that. And Many scholars, of course, just like that, had assumed that ancient artists were predominantly men. And so this finding and this research overturns decades of archaeological dogma. And there are dogmas everywhere, as we will see today. It also means that the last time women held most of the jobs in any field was about 20,000 years ago. That's right. More, more often than not, you will find statics from women in science, 14%, 24% in V as part of the Indian National Young Academy of Science. We are very happy to say we have almost 30% women in the group, but 75% in any field, yes, you have to go back 20,000 years to the caveman and the cave women to see that they were the ones who were really, the women were making all the difference then. How many people in your class, if you're a student, are female? Think about it. I would say quite a few, right? If not, just an equal equal. Similarly, how many lab members, if you're a researcher, how many lab members do you have who are female? Again, I would say quite a lot of girls in my lab, of course, quite a lot of students. So more girls in the classrooms, more girls in the in the labs, and then group leaders. How many group leaders in your institute are female? So what what you know, where's that number gone? Is the big question that we keep answering most of the time. 
And so my talk today is going to be about how females can indeed mentor each other. There is lots of negativity out there if you want to see it. But I think it's also important to retain a sense of humor that I want to be talking about because today especially is the United Nations International Day for Women and Girls in Science. And so as Yasha has already introduced to you, I am Gitanjali and I have a dual appointment and that's in UK and India. This is a picture that you probably have seen long, many times, or possibly you've heard the dialogue, let them eat cake. This is the one of the most famous quotes in the world, and it has been attributed to Mary Antoinette, the Queen of France during the French Revolution in the 1700s. As the story goes, it was the Queen's response upon being told that her starving peasant subjects had no bread. And that's what she said. She said, let them eat cake. Now, if now think to the present day, cut across 300 years. If today such a thing had happened, and of course the world is having a lot of problems, if such a thing were to be said to, let us say, Donald Trump, and if he was living in the 18th century and he had heard the peasants that they have no bread, and he would have said, let them eat cake, a lot of people would have, and a lot of people would have laughed him off today. But when Mary Antoinette said it, the Queen of France, they chopped off her head on the guillotine. But did she ever really utter those words? Probably not. And I can say it because I've had, you know, I've read practically everything that I've ever been ever been able to find, anything that's ever been documented about her, but I still can't get over the fact that her children were the age of my children when she was taken away from them from the bus field to be taken to the guillotine. So the point, I think the point I'm trying to say over here is that every industry, including politics, the royalty, nations, and of course, science is rough on women, but you can overcome your obstacles if you work hard and take risks. And of course, that's part of the game. Whatever you're good at, do that job as well as you can. But more importantly, be unstoppable. OK, as hard as it may seem when you know you see me writing it over here or talking about it, you've got to try to retain a sense of humor also because comedy makes the good times and the bad times better. Have you ever felt the pressure of being the lowliest rung in the ladder? Anybody who can think about it and think, yeah, it's I'm too far below on the ladder and there's just no way I'm going to get up far up there. So what you can do is you can you can make your career a jungle gym instead of a ladder. OK, go left, go right in between, jump up sometimes and so on. And that can be done if you think of humor and humor can be a release. It breaks the tension in stressful situations. It can also give you hope when there is no hope. And I think that is why women have always, always been funny. We don't associate fun and being funny with women so much, but because we're multitasking all the time and there's so much that we see that we think is not the best that's happening in the world, but we still manage with it. So it's because we've got the hope and that is why uh, the fact that women are funny and have always been funny, women have never got the credit for it. More often than not, you see comedians, it'll be men. The stand-ups, it'll be men. The big Hollywood funny movies, I think it'll be written, written by women. Or they will be given credit for it. So the rule is good girls are not loud. And this was a big issue with me for many, many years. I have a habit of being loud and I've always, and it shows if I'm, if I'm angry, it shows in my shaking voice. If I'm happy, it shows in my loudness. And for years I was thinking now that I'm a lecturer and I've got to be teaching, I loved people who could teach softly, slowly, nicely, you know, and I couldn't do that. And very recently I saw Hadley Wickham and he was so loud and he's got this way of teaching art and he's the God of all things are. I loved it that he was loud. And so I'm not embarrassed any longer. So this again is is my Indo UK joint appointment that you see in front of me. But more or more often what I want to be able to say is that you don't have to you don't have to be bothering about not being loud. You don't have to be bothering about not being funny. You can be both of that and some more if you want to be. So this is my lab and I think I'll talk about a little bit of my past, especially because I want today's talk to be less about my work, but more about the women who have helped me at various times um, during my during, uh, uh, you know, 
um, my career. So I did my graduation in botany, and I've said this many times. So I've done so many different subjects, and Yasha has just mentioned it to you. Then I did biomedical research, but the thing was. When I went to do biomedical research, and today you will have Dr. Daman Suluja, who's currently the director of the ACBR, and she was at that time, she was at that time a senior researcher. I think she was a group leader still at ACBR. Twenty two was that? Well, was that? Yeah, I think it was. It was 1999, and I was a student, and I did not want to. I had done botany, and I was very happy with botany, and I loved plants, but I didn't want to continue studying the same subject and I kept thinking that maybe I'm making the biggest mistake of my life trying to think of a different subject and then I walked in to this institute which was the Ambedkar Center for Biomedical Research and I thought biomedical research that sounds interesting just from the word just from the the look of it it sounded interesting and so I uh, went in and I walked in and the guard says whom do you want to meet I said I want you're interested you might want to apply do you want to come back next year and I told her I want to come back next year. I did not think at that time ki ek saal ka drop ho jayega to kya ho jayega. You know, this is things that we grow up with. These conventions that we grow up with. That ek saal ka drop ho jayega to kaun marne wala hai, bhai? Nothing's going to happen for God's sake. This is something you wish to do, and if you want to do, and it's worth it. So she says, if you think she says I can't do anything for you today, uh, this year, but maybe. And she didn't promise. She said maybe next year we might have a course. And next year Delhi University announced a new course. In fact, it was an integrated PhD. A masters and phd but it wasn't like you come in you're interested you join there was a series of interviews and a series of written tests and i took all of them and i didn't find her anywhere and i was sure she would have forgotten me and i don't know how it happened and then then i think she was on leave at that time or something but later of course i joined the institute i was the first batch of i was in the first batch of the acbr uh, biomedical integrated phd students and one fine day, this teacher walks in to teach us molecular biology, and I recognized her. The truth is that I hadn't seen her for a year or more, and then I recognized her. And I didn't tell her about my coming in and meeting her, but many years later, and now we are friends, many years later, I told her, ma'am, aapko yaad hai, aapse milne aai thi, aur aapne mujhe bataya tha ki kuch ho sakta. It's not like she didn't refuse, she didn't say it can't happen. She said, there is hope, and she gave me hope, and that was all I needed at that time, because I didn't want to do all the things that others that my peers at least and there's a lot of peer pressure so so what they were doing so i thought that maybe i wanted to do something different and she gave me hope that i could do something different eventually i did do something different and so on so even after my uh, masters then I did my phd in immunology of course and then i transitioned to a pi but transitioning to a pi that question was again at that time the idea was to travel and you know do a postdoc a successful postdoc and then come back as more more to a senior position, not to that lowest rung of the ladder. So you had to do a postdoc to come into a better position as a PI back in the Indian system. And I chose not to do it. And I didn't really choose not to do it. The truth was that my mentor then, Debashish Mohanty, who's now my friend again, he was my, I was his first student. He was my PhD supervisor. He said, if you don't have to stop in India, then you have to stop for four years and you have to do this job. So might as well look for it now. And computational biology, surely, as it was then, as is today, there's so much scope in computing data sciences that I keep telling in all my talks. But today's talk is not about data science. So I wanted to stay back in India and I got a chance to stay back in India and it was not that I just had an IPGR. I had multiple op opportunities and options and I chose to be at a research institution because I had done my PhD and masters at research institutions and had a good time. So Debashish gave me the, 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 the confidence to think that I could do it. And so soon after my my PhD in Viva, I was a full on uh, scientist, of course, at the lowest rung of the ladder here at NIPGR, where I feel good today to be among the upper rungs of the ladder, of course. So uh, <clears throat> my Viva was another interesting story. At my Viva, I met Shekhar Mande because he was my, he's the DGCSIR today, but in those days, he was just another PI, just like everybody else. And so he, uh, he took my, he examined me for my thesis, uh, for my PhD. He was the first one to congratulate me on my PhD. And then he said, and then we were walking out when I had to just say, uh, see him off. And he said that now you've completed your, your PhD and you're not going to call me sir or anybody else for that matter. Start calling me Shaker because we are equals now. And on that day, I called him Shaker. From that day till today, I've called Shaker 
by his name. And I, I, I implore upon you, whoever's listening, even if one of you can change this mindset and stop using the ma'am and sirs and Mujibi, please don't call me ma'am. The thing is, we've got to get rid of it. These are the Dakya Nusi. Oh, rings, you know, all sorts of strings that we keep attaching ourselves to get over it. I didn't. And he, and I would never have believed it unless Shekhar had said it himself. And even to date, he's as open minded. All his students call him by his first name. And I think we've got to inculcate this sense in ourselves also. Other than that, it was the other first thing I want to talk about is when I when I joined an IPGR and I had my first paper uh, that was with Professor Kasturi Datta and this lady, I mean, she she's not a computational biologist. She's a great geneticist, great cell biologist, molecular biologist, and she she wanted some computing, some computational uh, modeling done in her in her question, which was and I did love. I did it and we found something really interesting. And then when I was writing the paper, as any postdoc would have done, any student would have done, you do the work and you write the paper. She walked up to me and this lady, it's for her to say that she walked up to me in my office is not a small thing because it's difficult for her to climb those steps. But she climbed three steps of stairs to come up to my office to tell me one thing. She says, Gitanjali, you're going to be the corresponding author. You're the one who's done this work. You're the one who's taking the work wherever it goes. So you're going to be the corresponding author of the paper and learn that for life, that if you're doing something, you take the credit for that. Nobody else does. And and that was the next step in my in my life. So then then, of course, again, I would say everything else is history from them. But indeed, there was one more lady. There is one more lady who is a very close friend of mine and has been a teacher. So many of my teachers have been friends, of course. So this is Vani Brahmachari and of course, Aarti Saxena. I mean, they, uh, Vani Brahmachari, uh, uh, she came to Delhi the same year that I returned to Delhi for doing the biomedical research course. All I wanted ever was to be her PhD student, but things were, of course, not to be. Everyone's got their own fate. And I feel students today, even then, students give up on things just because they don't get what they feel is, you know, the lab that they want to be in. I never got the lab that I wanted to be in. I never got the postdoc at Howard that I wanted to be in, but yet I made the choices that I did. And I think I've been relatively reasonably OK. And so don't give up just because something is something you can't that you desperately wanted today didn't come to you today. It may come in many other ways and so on. OK, so that's about Vani Brahmachari, Aarti Saxena, Kalyani, all of them from Venki, of course, where I did my graduation. So what is the, the so so and then 10 years at an IPGR and then I joined Cambridge in 2016, which also you can see over here. And I think I'm going to talk about the research that I decided to do when I joined up, when, even today, what I'm doing, because I've got my degrees and I've studied so many different subjects. My work is at the interface of botany, chemistry, and geography. The 1947 Nobel, as you can see over here, was awarded to Sir Robert Robinson for his, his, his investigations on plant products of biological importance, especially the alkaloids. I'm particularly interested in the terpenes and the terpenome and how these chemicals are making the plants do what they're doing. And a lot of it has got to do with the chemical language of communication that plants have developed. And now, um, you know, starting next year, I'm hoping that we can begin a new phase of AI for PI for plant. That means artificial intelligence for plant intelligence. And I'm trying many which ways to get more people to join me on this on this effort so we can look at the huge amounts of data sets that are available in plants, in the plant world, and we need more data scientists. We need more people to come and join me as well as take it on yourself independently. If you can, we've got to deep learn the plant chemistry, the plant terpenome, and we can do it. So I'm doing it in various ways, uh, but but today's talk again is not about research. Today's talk is about about the course of the course of this research. So I've got, I think Yasha mentioned a few. I uh, uh, I was hoping not, but then there are several awards that I got. And five years ago, I decided I would stop applying for any more for different personal reasons, of course. But in those days, so this was one where the the Haryana Yuva Vigyan, which was where I was the first awardee uh, for, for this award. And compared to all of my other national international awards this one was a regional one from my state haryana and the chief minister gave it to me and i have often talked about this award in many of my 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 talks when i speak to people mentor talks especially that there are two things that i took away from this this award was that 
it's not important what award you get. It's just that somebody recognizes you and that feels good. And that feel good factor is your right. And it's OK to feel good about it. My entire village arrived in truckloads to see me getting the award from the from the chief minister, even though in in I would say in in professional terms, it was probably not the number one award that I would uh, you know, I would say that's my most important award in life. So, so this wasn't, but for them it was. And my 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 son was born two weeks before the day I got this award, and I had to travel to to Chandigarh at that time, and uh, it was not considered a good thing. I mean, when you have a baby, you're supposed to stay home for forty days at least, and that's that's what we've known forever. But I had to go because not because I wanted the award, but because. The truckload was coming from the village and my grandfather was so proud about it. He had he wanted everybody in the village to see that his granddaughters got it. And I had to be there to, to, to give him that moment of feeling that pride. So I was there and I took my daughter who was I think she was just one year plus when my son was born. I think my daughter was one year, two months or something like she's she's she was little. She's still very little. So she and I went and there she you know, at the moment when I had to take the award, this girl says, nee, mommy has to come and tie my shoelaces. So and then I went up the, and then the CM said, yes, you can do this. So I tied her shoelaces and I came back and I got the award. But these two things that I've been talking about, about that award, there's one thing that I missed altogether. And the thing that I missed, which I noticed very, very, very recently, and which is why I want to go back to the younger me and all of the women out there listening to me today who are possibly younger women than me at least uh, is are you the only girl in the room i was that day i was the only girl getting that award and it's and now that i think back it was not the only time i have been the only girl many times in many places and i made the huge mistake the huge blunder of thinking that I'm special or that there's something about me that I'm there. And the truth is that if you're the only girl in the room, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean you're good. It means something is wrong with the system and that something is very, very wrong and we've got to change it. And it doesn't come from changing the world. As I show you, it comes from changing people's mindsets and we've got to change it together. OK, so I am now not so proud of all those times when I was the only girl in the room and I I wish I could go back and say this to the younger me and change what little bits possibly I could have changed. But we go on as we go on. And which remind brings me to the other other big issue in science or about women in science, which I think we've got to talk about more and listen to and think about more. This is Rosalind Franklin. I'm sure those of you who are life scientists have obviously definitely heard of the great chemist and molecular biologist. She was one of the key figures. She was the key figure behind unlocking the structure of the human DNA. But who do you think of when you think about the human DNA, when you read in books about uh, uh, the human DNA? You don't see her name so often, do you? Now, Rosalind Franklin was one of the very few women doing world class, re world class research in 1950s. And she is among. OK, hold on. I think I've lost it. Am I the only one speaking or is there anybody else here? Hello? No, ma'am, we are listening to you. Phew, I thought I've, I've glitched out and I'm just going on blabbering to the screen and there's no one listening. <laughs> I mean, you don't have my number, do you, Yasha? You've got to be able to call me if something goes wrong. Okay. We will tell you if something goes okay. wrong. <laughs> yeah. so, so coming back to Rosalind Franklin, because I want everyone to hear it, and I don't want anyone who, who doesn't know about it already to miss it. So Rosalind Franklin, chemist, molecular biologist, one of the very few women doing research and world-class cutting-edge re research in 1950s, way back. She's among history's most prominent subjects of the sub of the of the of the topic called Matilda effect. It means the practice of practice of ascribing women's accomplishments to men. Uh, she was an ex 
huge expert in X-ray crystallography. She was the one who led the team that created what has been called arguably the most important photograph ever taken. And you're seeing that photograph on this slide right now. It's called Photograph 51. The Photo 51 is the most important picture that has ever been taken because this picture was the picture which revealed the helical structure of DNA. Rosalind Franklin created this picture. However, when the, when the structure of DNA was published three years later in 1953, Rosalind Franklin was not in the authors. Who were the authors? Have you ever heard the names James Watson and Francis Crick? So these two guys, both of them researchers at my university, University of Cambridge, they gained priority as the discoverers of the structure of DNA. And we've often been talking about this is the first computational biology big news that ever came out. Truly, it is. It is. But how did this happen that the girl who got the picture was not even an author in that paper? Now, that's because there were four people in the story. There's another guy called Maurice Wilkins, and he was working with um, uh, Rosalind Franklin. And without Franklin's knowledge or her permission, which she would never have given, by the way, uh, he showed photo 51 to Watson. The rest, as they say, is history. And in 1962, Watson and Crick and also Maurice Wilkins, this third guy, they shared the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for discovering the structure of DNA. The comments from Watson and Crick have over the years revealed the gender harassment that Franklin was enduring in the lab throughout the double helix. There's this big book that was written. Of course, the double helix is the biggest thing in life sciences, right? So there are books and theses and treatises and monographs written on it. But the most famous one is the book called The Double Helix. I don't know how many of you have read it, but this is a world famous uh, book by by Watson himself. And this book was written in 1968 when he was really giving the whole story of his life and telling you what a great man he is and should be and will always be. He recounted the and this this is the book where he's talking about the race to the structure. You know who got the structure first, how many people were fighting for it. And finally, the winners were Watson and Crick. So Watson in this book refers to Franklin as Rosie. He calls her Rosie, which was not a name or a nickname that she ever used or was used to her face. And he wrote in the book that Rosie, you know, Rosie never used lipstick. He felt that lipstick would have been good to contrast her straight black hair. And at the age of 31, imagine the age of 31, Watson says her dresses. Oh, she was showing all the imagination of an English blue stocking adolescent. Nobody wondered at that time why Watson is not talking or critiquing about his male colleagues' cosmetic choices, but he had to talk about Rosie and her cosmetic choices. So, 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 all right, stop back. When I'm angry, I cannot hide it. My words and my voice shakes with anger, but I think I've never been as angry as I've been with, with uh, Rosalind's story and James and Watson Crick and the fact that both of them are at, were at Cambridge and that everyone who goes to Cambridge, including myself, you know, we think it is the mecca of, of the place where we all study and they, we always go to the Eagle pub. Eagle is where these two sat and worked out things and the rest is history. But I think it's very important for us to know the women who were behind it and who got left behind. And they, they're not to be forgotten. I'm not saying that we can change the world, or as I said, you can change the world, but we can change mindsets. Even if one of you today has realized that it's not necessary just because somebody is a big man and a Nobel winner and everybody's been talking about him or her forever, you you can still be a better human being and you can change somebody's mindset and that's more important. And the first mindset you should be changing is your own. And that's where I think each one of us can make a real difference. OK, so what is it that we've been doing? So at least never more in my room would be just one lady or just one woman. And I can make sure or I can ensure that we are in this together and maybe in the long run, we would be more equal than we can. And e such little drops will make the ocean. And so it, it makes a difference. OK, beyond scientific research, I, this is not the day that I talk much about my science scientific research, but I will talk about this program that I've been on for the last four years. It's called Tigris. It's a, grow, it's, it's a Global Challenges Research Fund Grow Award. And Tigris is an acronym for, 
sorry, Transforming India's Green Revolution by Research and Empowerment for Sustainable Food Supplies. And this program essentially is, is uh, run between the University of Cambridge and, and India, and almost 30 organizations are involved. I'm one of the uh, PIs on the project, and there's so much we've been doing. But one thing that Tigris made me see, which I hadn't done in the 10 years when I was working at an epigeon in India, closed up in my four walls in this office, in my lab, doing just the things that I wanted to do, just the research grants. I think what I didn't do was get out there and do some outreach. Outreach was a word I had heard, but I didn't really understand what it was. And I think it was only after Tigris happened that I realized the value and the and the sheer happiness that outreach can bring. So I did some outreach and met with students uh, in rural India as well as in rural uh, England and everywhere that I went, what I found was it was worth it. It is worth it to go and make somebody or tell somebody something that they didn't know or give them a skill that they didn't know before. And I consider myself quite skilled. So I think I have a couple of skills that I can share. And so I've been training during the pandemic. Yasha did talk about it when she was introducing me. I'm one of the instructors at the Cambridge Bioinformatics training for the last five years indeed. But what we've been doing is we've been teaching the power of R. And what you will notice here is that we've been teaching data science, not as lectures, as codes, of course, but as cartoons, and this has happened again because of a lady, Alison Horst, and you will meet her today uh, and, and see her today, and you're welcome to follow her today because she's a cartoonist and she's an R expert and she's a brilliant scientist on top of everything else. And we all use her cartoons to teach R to our students. We very recently did this women in AI program and uh, for Indian women trained by 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 uh, Cambridge instructors and of course myself because I consider myself a living bridge between India and Cambridge. A lot of questions, a lot of people asked, where do we pick up data skills? You know, I'm a student, I'm a teacher, I'm a professor, I'm just an unemployed person sitting at home or I'm a single mother. I want to pick up data science. Where would I do it? You can do it in so many places. And right now, the bioinformatics workshop, Fiesta of the, of the Asia Pacific Bioinformatics Network, they are offering these courses at the at four different levels, as you can see on the slides here, essential, beginner, intermediate and advanced. And you can start using these, you know, take these courses and use your own data, download data, create data, whatever else. But the main thing is we want to remove the fear of coding from your mind. If you're a researcher and if you don't know coding, then it doesn't work. You've got to, in addition to everything else that you've been doing in research, you have to know how to code. And so we can help you to do that. And we did what we did it. So we started in December 2020. I mean, of course, throughout the pandemic, I've been doing it, but we did the longest four day course in 2020 where we taught these women and I I got to know. So there was a vice chancellor of an Indian university. She took the course. There was a head of department of the statistics department of, a, of an Indian university. She took the course and she said, you know what? We have been teachers and we ourselves were students like 25, 30 years ago. And in those days, there was no R, there was no Python, there was no Java, there was no new age ways of teaching students. So today we have to teach students the skills that we never learned. So how do we pick up those skills? And then so so they came to us and we taught them these skills. And therefore, we are planning to do the next V with their course in April now. And you're welcome to join up if you're a, if you're a practicing teacher. Welcome to join us on the group as a trainer. If you want to pick up, join us up as 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 a student or a participant. And uh, I'll be uploading uh, these pieces of news various places, but I will be posting them on my Twitter account. You're welcome to join me on Twitter. My Twitter ID is JillianV. This is the course we did in uh, 2020, and I told you about so many women who were there. The best part was that my colleague at Cambridge, Ale uh, Alexia Cardona, she's another woman I want to talk about because she was the one who who really made the whole thing into a game. Teaching data science is truly a game. It is not a boring thing. It's not something scary that you have to learn for loops. Like I have been myself worried about for loops for many years. And the truth is they're not, they're very simple. And if you're a programmer, you would know how to use them. But Alexia and Alison Horst, whom I was talking about earlier, they make life so much easier by just telling you how that, how it can be made a game or a cartoon. And so we did that and we had a fantastic time. And Alexia has started the Our Ladies at Cambridge. And I want to be able to join, you know, I want us to have 
a group and of course i'm an r person by now you would have guessed of course we should have an, we should have an our ladies india or we should have more of more of us biologists in the our ladies india rather than just data scientists who are from other vertices or verticals in the world of health industry or or finance industry and so on more biologists need to be data scientists and therefore learning data science is very important and when you look around you see data everywhere but data science is not just about being able to model that data or doing you know running a supervised or unsupervised machine learning model on your data set it's about being able to look at your data import it correctly clean it up transform it the way you want to be able to see it and to be able to ask the right questions to it and then to be able to visualize it and then comes the issue of modeling your data and finally after getting results the question is about communicating your data also right so alison horst is the is the data science cartoonist that i love so much and i use her slides or her cartoons in every which way when i'm teaching students some of those i'm going to show you today to just give you an idea that data science is fun and if you haven't done it yet this is the time to pick it up first thing that we teach in data science is the difference between clean data and dirty data. So all tidy data, all good data is alike. Like all happy families, they're all happy in the same way. But every messy data set, just like every unhappy family, they're all unhappy in very different ways. And you can never start to count the number of ways you can be unhappy, right? Similarly, every messy data set is messy in its own way, and you can't start to clean it out. So it's very, very important to first clean your data and make it tidy. That's the first step you do in data science. And the second thing I find lots of students get so confused. What are these data sets? What's normal? What is abnormal? What is unnormal? So well, there are no, so we, we teach different kinds of data. So what's nominal data? What's ordinal data? What's binary data? When do you need binary data as compared to nominal data? So nominal data is on the left side. If you're a turtle, if you're a small snail, or if you're a butterfly, then you may have an unordered. You basically have an unordered group of descriptions. This is nominal data. Ordinal data is when you have very ordered descriptions. Now there's this little bee here. She's unhappy. After a little bit, she's OK. And then long, she's awesome. So from unhappy to OK to awesome is an ordered description of data. And so this is ordinal data. In the same way, binary data, binary data has only two mutually completely exclusive outcomes. Either you're extinct or you're not. Either you're zero or you're one, either you're yes or you're no, and so on. So we teach different kinds of data sets to students. And there's one big issue, type one errors, type two errors. We teach a lot of statistics. And so the question is, what's a type one error and what's a type two error? Again, Alison Horst has made it so, so neat for you to know what type two errors are and what type one errors are. Just by looking at the picture, you can make out what it is to know if you're looking at a false positive or if you're looking at a true negative. OK, for loops, for loops is where people have problems. I had problems for many years, so why not for loops? And truly, somebody should be writing for loops, but it doesn't have to be you. That's what Hadley Wickham said, and I loved it because it's been written. If you use the tidy data words, the universe of tidy data and per and do functional programming as we try and teach you in so many of our lectures, you would not be worried about for loops. And we can pick this up just as Alison Horst and uh, Hadley Wickham have taught us with vanilla cupcakes. Those of you who have taught your children or baked or love baking have made vanilla cupcakes would know that there are these, there are these bakery cookbooks and everyone has their own version of bakery cookbooks, but in most of the versions, you will have something that looks like this. On one side, you will have the ingredients. On the other side, you will have, have the steps to do. You have to preheat the oven, then you put the flour and the sugar and the sour baking powder, and then you whisk it here and you whisk it there, then mix it here and then mix it there, then put it in the oven, wait for a number of minutes, and pull it out and eat it up. Now, suppose you wanted to do a chocolate cupcake the very same kind of page, but a separate page. So the cookery cookbook would have 200 pages of 200 different cupcakes and each page loaded with this kind of information and this kind of data that you don't need to see every time and you could potentially do without. Isn't it? And confuses because now if I want to build, the, make the chocolate cupcake and I find that almost everything looks very much like, like what was there in the vanilla cupcake. The difference is only that little line which says 
that you should have a three fourths cup flour and a little bit of cocoa powder, cocoa powder there, right? So the difference is only in the two lines there and in the word cocoa on the other side. The rest is identical between the vanilla cupcake and the chocolate cupcake and maybe the banana cupcake and the strawberry cupcake. So what would a programmer do? If you're a programmer and if you're a smart one, you would think about making it shorter cleaner and more precise. So you just put the vanilla, you just note what are the special things that are required in the vanilla cupcake. And therefore, there's so many dry ingredients, all of them colored brown, so many wet ingredients, all of them colored blue, just whisk together all the wet people and then all the dry people and then mix them up. It's the same simple strategy. You don't need 200 pages in your cookery book. A single table would have done the job. And so you can have your vanilla cupcake and the chocolate cupcake and maybe banana and strawberry cupcakes on the same page. And that's how you've learned data science. And that is in its true sense data science. And that is functional programming by building a cookery book of a single page, which has everything together in one place. You stick it up in front of your kitchen in front of your microwave oven and you choose whichever cupcake you want to make and it's right there, isn't it? So isn't that simple? So this is just what we do when we teach R and we teach deplier, mutate and so many things. I welcome you to take one of the courses that we are doing. And so you would be able to, and, and if you don't take one of the courses that we are doing at Cambridge or here um, uh, under the week with their series in India, Please take the courses online. I mean, Hadley Wickham does these courses. Alison Host is very much into teaching. There are so many Alexia Cardona teachers. All of us and all lots of other people are also uh, the, the whole R teaching community. If you're on Twitter, uh, join the R community. It's a fun place to be and it always has something you would not have known previously and you would enjoy learning it. OK? With that, of course, this is my protocols from home series. What I've been doing over the past one year and a half is I've been teaching uh, visualization of your data as networks in various softwares, which are so easy and trickable. We've been uh, using a lot of, we do a lot of RNA-seq in the labs, but a lot of students outside, I notice that the moment you say RNA-seq, people get scared. So we've tried to make it easy to use transcriptome data sets, and we've given examples from, I mean, I gave examples from ecology and systems biology from my own work. There's a lot of WGC and that I teach clustering, consensus modules, you know, my own programs and software that I've used, Nextcade and so on. Um, so some of the courses are, are uh, uh, lined up in March, April and June in the coming year. But if you want, again, updates or queries, you can see my Twitter ID is here. And more often than not, if you write an email to me, I may not respond, but if you, but I will always, always tweet about it. And so if any new course is coming up, not just by mine, if I see a good course happening anywhere else in any of my networks, I would always tweet about it. So you would be able to see it, take it up. Overall, I think I'm coming to the end of my, my talk now. Oh, I have a missed call on my phone. I hope it's not from the organizers here saying ki aap bolte chale gaye aur yahan koi sun nahi raha tha. But anyway, coming back, uh, there's always some rock and there's always some balance that you've got to do. There's things about women in STEM that you will hear. You've got your work balance, life balance, all sorts of balance, but everybody does it. And we've been doing it forever from the time we were painting the cave paintings that we never got credit for. And so therefore, don't worry about the low global averages. Think about the positive side. Try to be, try to take it as a funny, uh, uh, you know, try to laugh in the face of gender bias. And uh, there's lots that DST, DBT, and UGC are doing for women. I've listed out a couple of things here, but there are two things that are not on this list, which have not yet been announced allowed by the government. But the Gati program, which is very much similar to the Athena Swan in the UK, is being brought to India. And right now, if you're a teacher, at a university or organization, please get in touch with DST Gathi, where they would pair you up with a UK organization for the next five years to bring in measures for uh, having equal um, roles of women and men in the in the workplace, particularly in science and the natural sciences. In addition, there's this new thing that I'm involved in at the India UK interface, which is the crop science fellowships. I find and I find it very unfair that all of the you know, all of the funds, uh, the Welcome Trust funds, particularly for scientists in India, they are not for plant scientists, and this isn't right. And and so we are, okay, not to talk about what isn't right, what we can do, what can 
you know, you do about it. So what we've done about it is we've come up with a new crop science fellowship at the India UK interface, where if you're a PhD student or a final year student or a new postdoc or a young PI, you are you can spend two years at one of the eight top labs or organizations in the UK, whichever you choose for your area, and it will be fully funded by the Department of Biotechnology. We are hoping that this would be announced very soon publicly, and then I would be able to talk about it on my slides, but not yet because it's still not announced. So with that, I come to an end of my talk, and I just want to say that it's really important for you to think again about whatever it is that you've been doing for however long it's been that you've been doing you've got to interrupt yourself you've got to stop apol apologizing you've got to stop mamming and sirring and you've got to laugh a little bit more in the end on the international on today which is the international day for women and girls in science 11th of february i want to just leave the, uh, leave you with with uh, one message that you've got to be able to share with me an unshakable belief that having an equal number of men and women sitting at the table or in a room where decisions are being made is going to make this world a fairer and better place. It will also make the world a funnier place and that's where we want to be. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. That was such an inspirational and knowledgeable session. The Rosalind Franklin story and your story, it was really motivating. Also, the way you explain learning data science with the vanilla and chocolate cupcake recipe. Such an interesting way to describe it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Pitanjali, for sharing your journey with us. Uh, thank you for uniting women and voicing over the change in the world, especially when it comes to uh, ending the gender disparity. So, thank you, ma'am. Uh, with this, we conclude our second session by absorbing, enthralling, and getting inspired by Dr. Gitanjali Yadav. So, to start with the third session, I would like to request Dr. Yesha Hasija to please introduce our next speaker, Dr. Vidhu Sharma. Ma'am, please. Marie Curie, the first woman to win a Nobel Prize and the only woman in history to ever win it twice in two different sciences, rightly said. I was taught that the way of progress was neither swift nor easy. So to all the women and girls out there, no task is difficult if you have the right knowledge, dedication, and put in the concerted efforts to achieve your goals. With this, I am pleased to introduce you all to the next speaker, Dr. Vidhu Sharma from the University of British Columbia. Dr. Vidhu Sharma, a biochemist and a molecular biologist, comes with diverse experience in academic, private biotech, and healthcare sector. She specialized in medicinal chemistry in her master's program in biomedical sciences from Delhi University and continued with her PhD program in the same department with a focus on molecular characterization of serine proteases, especially the respiratory fungal allergens, to develop better diagnostic and therapeutic strategies. She then moved to Canada for her postdoctoral research at the University of British Columbia, where she further investigated the role of proteases in osteoporosis and atherosclerosis. Further, she served in Canadian biotech industry in a key leadership role in the cell biology department for more than five years, where she led research and development and new product development projects. She is currently working at BC Children's Hospital, UBC, managing advanced scientific technology platforms to help facilitate research by taking steps to improve operational efficiencies and enable access to innovative technologies to researchers. She is a science enthusiast and participates in outreach activities such as STEM Mentor for Youth in Science for more than 10 years. As a member of Canadian Network of Scientific Platforms, she engages with Canadian advanced technology platforms to build resources for scientific community, leveraging the expertise across Canada's state-of-the-art facilities. She is also an active member of Society of Canadian Women in Science and Technology, an immigrant and international women in science network. Both these societies actively engage to advocate equality, diversity, inclusion, and help it build a strong network of women in science. 
with these words i invite dr sharma to take over the session on stems career path challenges and rewards dr vidhu please please unmute your mic vidhu can you hear me all right yes okay uh let me just start sharing my screen uh, oops sorry i'm just trying to see where my screen uh all right All right. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am, it is. Perfect. And uh, I'm audible, right? Yes, ma'am, yes. Perfect. Thank you so much, Yasha, uh, for the grand introduction. It just makes me feel like a star. <laughs> and uh, thank you, Delhi Technical University, for giving me this opportunity to celebrate women in science. Uh, I did listen. I did get a chance to uh, listen to the previous talks, and uh, I'm stoked by all the accomplishments and the great work that uh, women in science have done. And uh, I do uh, know one of them, Kitanjali, like she was my senior back in uh, in, in ACBR, and it is so such a pleasure to actually hear uh, the journey. So I would just start with a little bit sort of similar but a little bit more in depth of uh, all the accomplishments that women have made in science and also sharing my own stem journey so this is kind of the agenda for our next 30 minutes i'll go over uh, my stem journey talk about career options the gaps we should be working together to close and really the rewards why why stem but first of all as um, i i'm almost feeling very nostalgic to be present in India right now, thanks to uh, this invitation of presenting and celebrating. But uh, currently, I am on not our native land. I would like to begin the acknowledgement of uh, the land that we are, I'm presenting from. The BC Children's Hospital Research Institute operates on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, uh, Musqueam, Squamish, and Salvatooth nations. And further, this acknowledgement, gratitude, and respect extends to all the First Nations communities on whose traditional land uh, the Research Institute builds operation and re relationships and operations in BC. All right, with that, I would start with my STEM journey. Now, as far as I remember, like really going back to the childhood, the first person who the first woman in STEM actually who really uh, inspired me. Uh, to st start or to pursue my STEM journey was my mother. Yes, she was a STEM teacher. And the she was not just a science teacher. She was the first ever person among her peers to be graduated in science way back in that time when there were not many women in who would even graduate or who, who would even actually go beyond their secondary education. So that was something incredible that I, I started my childhood in that environment and she was teaching she was a science teacher from the very beginning and the way she enriched our work environment both my parents were teachers so the way our environment was enriched with the with the resources with books around us with the activities around us that really helped me develop my curiosity in science and again giving the examples oops giving the examples of what kind of things she was doing like she would be showing me her watch with radium dial and we'll talk about radium we'll talk about madame curie there'll be prism piece and we'll be talking about diffraction looking at the night sky there are the constellations look at the ursa major minor making the you know diy projects of science models like uh, whether it's a it's it's a it's a molecule of a tetrahedron or it's a kaleidoscope. Like this was my favorite one, uh, the one with the broken bangles. I'm not sure how many of you have made like in this generation, but uh, but we did. And those were the things that actually helped a lot in uh, developing my curiosity in science. 
going further, yes, I was like, this is one of my favorite experiment. And I continue to do that with my daughters as well, like making sugar crystals. And the pop-ups of the DIY projects I used to love making with the evolutionary, for the evolution to learn about evolution, the dinosaurs. And if that's not everything, I don't know if any of you have seen that. Maybe some of the speakers who would probably, of, well, of, of my time, would have, would remember Professor Yeshpal, who used to be a STEM educationist. And this used to be a program turning point that used to come on the television. And I used to regularly tune in and watch his show, participate in the contests, and really be excited about science. And even further, like this is really me exploring science in the kitchen and uh, my parents they would always say that he, she cooks like a scientist i wasn't sure what they meant by that but i actually used to take that as a compliment i used to think i'm doing something very creative very innovative i would be mixing up stuff and making my own recipes not really following the recipe but really making my own so all of that really made my uh, my my childhood, a very curiosity rich explorer, and uh, that's kind of where I started uh, getting excited about science. And to a no, definitely not a surprise, I uh, moved on on my STEM journey uh, by graduating in biochemistry honors. And they were wonderful teachers from Shivankateshwar College who inspired me further to explore uh, and advance uh, further in interdisciplinary course. And ACBR was uh, my destination to do my master's program in biomedical sciences. And furthermore, I continued uh, in the integrated PhD program, uh, which was with ACBR, but I was working at IGIB and uh, in biomedical sciences. I also got an opportunity to teach science in as a, as a college lecturer in biochemistry in Venkateshwar College as well. And after my PhD, my, uh, my journey, uh, my STEM journey in India moved to Canada. I was invited as a visiting scientist to work in, uh, UBC, in the UBC. And from that time onwards, uh, I have been at UBC uh, since all those years. Now talking about my PhD research. So at IGIB, my focus of my research was on recombinant and native allergens. And essentially what I was doing was I was using biochemistry, biochemical methods, molecular char characterization uh, of the allergens, essentially to learn about what makes protein an allergen. Protein is a ha like uh, allergens are otherwise harmless, but they are there are certain small signature motifs which could be potentially making them allergen. So my study was to to find out the signatures, the conserved regions in the proteins, in such proteins that make them cross-reactive allergens. Because for example, if somebody is allergic to fungi, they might be allergic to food, they might be allergic to uh, cockroaches or dust mite or grass, variety of different things. So I was interested in knowing what makes it allergen. And again, I'm not going to go a lot into the research, but you know, this is, this is the science uh, research topic as well. So uh, further, I used the bioinformatic tools and homology modeling methods to learn about uh, epitopes that are important, that are cross-reactive, and testing those allergen-derived peptides for immunotherapy in a mouse model of allergy. In, during this program, I, we also developed a diagnostic kit uh, that got pat patented later that was useful for detection of respiratory allergy. This was... Uh, really an exciting journey for me. And I learned, I was exposed to a variety of different advanced technologies and the uh, collaboration opportunities. I was also outreaching at that time as well. I used to go for uh, STEM outreach activities in, in, in government uh, school programs. I don't remember the name of that program, but there was like each one teach one kind of a program where uh, we used to go as, as young scientists from the lab and used to do some experiments with the, with the, with the schools uh, in, 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 in some of the uh, rural areas in, in, in Delhi. Then in my uh, experience as a visiting scientist, I got exposed to a brand new lab environment and a brand new project. I was absolutely having no idea about the C. elegans, but I, in, in, in this role, I was working on two projects. One was to learn about the role of MRAS in ERK phosphor phosphorylation pathway using C. elegans. And the only thing that I remember is to, um, is to, is to look under the microscope, these little creatures, these little organisms, and uh, count their vulva. 
that was uh, <laughs> that was something that I had never thought about as as my science dream. But it was a very interesting uh, it way. It's an interesting way to learn about the role of RAS, and you know this is this is involved in cancer pathways. So it was an interesting uh, interesting uh, study that we did. And another project was uh, to screen large number of antibodies, like neutralizing antibodies that's the best for against a pro-inflammatory cytokine uh, DMCSF using cell-based assay. Again, it exposed me to new techniques and I was still exploring like, where is my interest? Where would, where would I like to go further? At that time as well, I was still continuing to uh, advance the science uh, outreach activities with several students. After that, I had maternity leave break for one year. And post maternity leave break, I uh, joined uh, Dieter Brahms lab at the University of British Columbia as a postdoctoral researcher. Now, my protease um, that I was working in my PhD as, a, as an allergen, now in, in my postdoctoral research, I started working with cysteine protease, a cathepsin that is uh, involved in extracellular matrix degradation. And this time the focus, the disease of focus was uh, atherosclerosis and osteoporosis. And my role, my research was to find out first, characterize the regions that are important for the bone resorption uh, of cathepsin K, and then find out the strategies that would, that would keep the active site intact and keep the non-active site, the allosteric, or the we used to call it exocyte at that time, but that name got changed later on as ectosteric, to find the smart inhibition strategies. The reason being the active site of this protein needs to be kept uh, need to be kept alive because this is an important protein required for regular bone metabolism, and letting it uh, fall apart is not going to be good for uh, the physiological system. So that's why we needed to develop therapeutic uh, strategies to target non-active sites. And that was what led me to also uh, find several uh, herbs and uh, natural uh, products, uh, Ayurveda, traditional Chinese medicine. So really like uh, giving another approach, another um, another angle to really discovering the the, the potential of these uh, these these region these things in in um, in in finding the newer uh, in, in newer th therapeutic targets. Again, at that time as well, I was involved in STEM mentorship program. I was uh, working with the Let's Talk Science, and I used to help the high school si high school students with the science projects. I used to also partner with teachers uh, for doing some youth mentorship programs as well. One of the my fondest memory from this lab was uh, really the hiking. The hi this lab entire lab used to have a very competitive hiking. We used to do a lot of hiking. We used to there used to be competitions of who runs to the mountain top and the first. Again, you can see I had a lab environment which had a good balance of girls and boys. So there was always like male and female ratio I had been going in was very friendly and uh, women in science friendly and during my postdoctoral research as well I, I started uh, getting very excited about learning about some of the industry uh, programs that were happening around us and I, I always was very um, excited about knowing that how industries work really fast-paced how they deliver research so much faster than the academic world and that was what made me really excited about. And I participated, I, I applied for NSERC uh, Industrial Fellowship. And I also applied for an NSERC Visiting Fellowship, which would lead to uh, join the government labs, which means like Health Canada or the uh, Canadian Food Inspection Agency that kind of uh, places. And I was successful. I was successful to get both uh, IRTF and the Visiting Fellowship. Now, I had to make choices at that time. After having my postdoctoral research for five years at UBC, I needed to make a choice of where do I want to go next. I wanted to do industry for sure. I knew that, and I also knew that I, I'm not. I wasn't that keen on really pursuing uh, the this research uh, as as an academic uh, uh, career. So I wanted to take the chance to be in industry and or between the uh, Canadian uh, lab. The tough choice I had to make. I really wanted to go to the Canadian lab as well, uh, the uh, government lab. But the reason I couldn't is because I had to move all the way from West Canada to East Canada. 
and with a young child and leaving the family, going all the way to the other side of the of the country was not something that I wanted to do. Again, that was more of my choice, not necessarily something that I was not supported. I was very much supported by my, my husband, my family, everybody was really supported. But I, I actually got an opportunity right in Vancouver in a biotech company. So I took that, uh, I, I took that opportunity. And that was when I joined in Applied Biological Materials. It was a very um, exciting opportunity. I, I, I had my own lab. I, I started working as a senior scientist, working on several exciting projects and seeing the research going so much faster. And soon I, uh, I, I was the team lead. I became the director for the cell biology department. And uh, my team grew, expanded from three people to 15 people, and that was, that was that was enormous and my department was working on cell line engineering as well as uh, the virus uh, product delivery meaning like various gene delivery methods including adenovirus uh, aav platform um, lentivirus uh, sendai virus so we were really generating all these things and again one of the things which i want to mention i i knew cell culture I had no experience at all working with the lentivirus or any of these viral delivery methods, but it was all learning on the go. So much so that I even learned CRISPR. That was a revolution. And it, I didn't learn about CRISPR during my undergrad or post-graduation or in PhD, but that was the power of uh, being educated in science you get to learn, you get to know the, how the research works. You, you really take it uh, fairly easily as compared to somebody who would likely have not heard about CRISPR. So I was very much intrigued and very fascinated by this technology. And we learned within, and again, we were working at industry pace. So what we needed to do was really get uh, onto that technology fast, start working on it, develop the workflow, streamline, standardize the practices, and then start working on it and start delivering research more for the researchers. So we started, uh, we not even just launched the product line, we launched several services and uh, had a huge success with the CRISPR uh, workflow in our department. Now this was kind of not just a science that I was doing there, but I was learning and developing a lot of my uh, uh, other non-STEM skills, which means uh, managerial skills, learning about the budget, learning about profit, learning about uh, really, you know, the communication of science, learning about how it needs to stay sustainable and profitable and how to really uh, standardize those practices to keep it. Hello? Am I, am I there? <laughs> Hello? You're there. You're there very much. All right. Okay. <laughs> you know what? It's Can just an odd world. It's just a very odd world. It just feels like, am I the only one who's speaking to the screen? All right. Thank you. Thank you for confirming. Okay. Uh, yeah. Coming back. So I think that was one of the very, very important thing, which I felt that uh, made me uh, more, that made me made more uh, I feel I'm hearing background noise. Is, is, am I being heard? All right. So yeah, I was able to develop myself more uh, complete into a STEM package because I had my scientific uh, experience as well as I had now the non-STEM, which is absolutely needed to to really uh, be like the to the best advantage. And now currently, I am at Children's Hospital. And in Children's Hospital, I'm further expanding the impact of research. Now, again, this is one of the things which I have now realized that what I had been following all the path is to how do we deliver research faster? How do we deliver research faster and make it more impactful? Now, after my for-profit experience in industry for more than five years, I when I moved to in, in, into the, this hospital setting, and start managing this business portfolio of all these advanced technologies. Essentially, with these advanced technologies are uh, those multi-million dollar equipment, infrastructure, state-of-the-art facilities, which make and expedite the research, progress the research so much more faster. For example, flow cytometry or histology or mass spectrometry, metabolomics, uh, uh, bioinformatic facilities and imaging facilities. So all of these things together, they are not easy to be set up 
for one uh, one one lab group, and it makes most sense to keep it in a shared resource as a shared resource. So what uh, my role is to really uh, first tap in the technologies that are available on site really train people on getting those uh, technologies on site and have those acquire those infrastructure writing in those grants to get those infrastructure and get those highly qualified personnel to get them going on those equipment to help with the research community further and at the same time we also run lots of training and uh, training programs to help the researchers use those equipment and uh, provide them state-of-the-art uh, research services and at the same time we are also all at this always continuously thinking about strategically finding new technologies that would help faster like for example the data science and uh, some of these things are really uh, coming up and uh, we are continuously tapping further how do we make it accessible to our researchers so essentially what we are doing here is expanding the impact and building the research capacity so these are the four pillars that we are working on having those state-of-the-art facilities attract talent and provide leadership opportunities to the budding investigators, the new investigators. It maximizes the operational efficiency, which also had been one of the guiding principles in my, uh, my previous experience as well. And efficient resource planning. Again, uh, coming from industry, I, I had become very frugal in how to use those resources. We needed to really keep, keep it more profitable. Here, it's not about profit, but it's about like maximizing the usage of the resources, maintain, like making sure that the plan is sustainable. And of course, this has led to uh, partnerships all across, not just within this campus, but outside and across Canada as well. And that's where uh, the, we are networking with the core facilities and the state of the art facilities all across Canada and really increasing those partnerships on how can we not, as if we don't need to invest it into that state of the art facility on our site, we don't need to because that's kind of where the partnerships come and collaborations are very, very important. That is one thing that I really learned. And in that way, I just did not increase the impact of research by my own research, but essentially you name it and we have it. We, we work on childhood cancer, GI diseases, vaccine research, disease markers. I mean, COVID had made our entire institute crazy with so much going on at that time. And uh, all of the different areas, we have been increasing the impact of research. So overall, my STEM journey had been pretty exciting, diverse. I had a lot of learning some adventure. And I would talk about that adventure in, in some of the slides. Of course, so I increased the chances of the, some of the challenges because I moved across the continent. I chose to uh, come to Canada and being a foreign national, of course, there are some of the things that you have to wait before it uh, before the opportunities are accessible to you. For example, for the work permit, or you need to be an immigrant, like, you know, the priorities are given to the the Canadian citizens, for example. So some of those challenges were there. But I think one of the key things is if you if you have that passion and if you have that drive, uh, I don't think it would stop you. Like, I mean, some, somewhere, somebody would come in and uh, you would find a way out of it. And of course, as a mom, like when during my maternity leave, there were some opportunities that were, uh, that could have been um, mine, but I, I chose that was my priority like i wanted to be with my child for the first year at least uh, and i needed to make that choice i made that choice to not move to the other part of the canada to kind of make it more difficult for everybody and i i think i i'm pretty happy with making that choice i i believe in that uh, that fundamental rule that there would always be opportunities so you know it's not that if, if it's not here today it would likely be there tomorrow so it's all right don't don't freak out if you ever lose an opportunity because you would choose something that's more closer to you that's something that that calls you that that is uh, that you're more connected to that brings you more happiness right well there are some gaps that we need to work and we need to work together on that and i think again one part we all agree stem women are smart women and i will not go into the story of rosalind franklin because uh, kitanjali ex 
like detailed it very, very well. But I would definitely recommend to uh, watch the documentary uh, Photograph 51. It's, it's excellent. And it actually talks about uh, all of this as well. And uh, I would just not, as I said, not go any further in that because I think you all have a good idea of, uh, of, of the lack of credit that was uh, that that really belonged to Rosalind and how she was not. I mean, it was not just uh, these external people. Like, again, the story says her father also really uh, discouraged her from um, doing science. I mean, they, they just think, like, it's it's not for you. Even when she was so bright, she was, she was so intelligent. Again, like, you know, this is something that probably... It, it again brings me also that anger that I feel like, why? And why, why was that? Uh, why, why did that happen? But... It was, and till the time, I mean, I would say it was a very naive of me to think that uh, Western countries are, you know, it, it, it's, it's not there probably, they're more developed. But when I actually had been going, uh, learning more and more about them, I'd been, I'd been thinking about it like, okay, they, there, there is a huge gap. And then there are these smart women from Apollo and uh, they have had also a very, uh, like there are se several studies that uh, they indicated that there had been so much of sexism at NASA, which means that they, 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 they are very, they were not given several opportunities that probably if they had those opportunities, probably would have made the work to go to Mars, probably we would have been closer. The lack of these opportunities leads to people like leads, ev leads everybody's loss because then you're no longer uh, closer to the success that we are all looking for. We want to make great discoveries, but you're just going with the 50% of people like that. 50% of the workforce is missing if you're not providing opportunities to, to smart uh, women. And now being a scientist, we are very data driven. And I, think this this does again very explicitly clearly and this is from this is the US data and uh, this is derived from uh, another documentary picture a scientist movie very very recommended movie uh, for this year for sure and it's a, it's a true story again and this data is absolutely true this is coming from uh, United States uh, from 2018 number of men employed versus number of female in STEM it's it's very like tilted balance. It shouldn't be like that. And if I look closer to that data, there are several women who do get the bachelor's degree, but then it reduces to master's, reduces to PhD, reduces postdocs, and it further, it goes to just less than 30% for when they're employed. So where is that leaky pipeline? What is happening? There is definitely the, the this is a data supported evidence that shows that something is not right. Yep, women, smart women are not, uh, sometimes they, they pose threat to people. I'm not sure how many of you might be familiar with these kind of wall of fames, <laughs> but I am. I have seen so several times if I walk in uh, one of these museums or places, I would see this hall of fame and wall of fames with all these white men pictures hanging. I have nothing against them, but I have I am always thinking about is like where where are your other fifty percent? Where are they? I don't think uh, when the Nobel Prize was um, launched, it was ever thought that it would be like that. But this is the real data. Again, we are all data driven people, right? So let's see the data. Now, this is very intuitive and i think uh, just what I need to show you or point you at is that all the gray dots that you see, are men who receive the Nobel Prizes. And all these little color dots that probably, I don't know if you can see, but this one, this is two, this is three. And this is, we are talking about more than a century. Three people, three women who got Nobel Prize in physics and just four got in chemistry and just these handful in medicine. I'm talking about the STEM field only, but like, yeah, you can see all over other fields as well. The representation of women is not good. That is a sad situation over a century and we just made to 19 Nobel Prizes for women. That's again, and if we, we increase another variable, which is women of color, that is uh, women who immigrate to other countries and they are not white. It's only one more than a century. We just have one person who got the Nobel Prize. That boils my blood. 
But again, this is something that really tells that there is way more that's happening beyond the tip of the iceberg. The tip of the iceberg is something that is very obvious. That is something that people see. It could be a very obvious, um, you know, some harassment at the workplace or something else that is that is witnessed by people. But there's a lot going below the surface and so much so that women, and again, it is not necessarily only for STEM, but all the other, many other fields as well. This is coming from the scientist's perspective. That's why uh, it, it is very applicable here. They are necessarily not given the credit example we have already from uh, you know the legendary Rosalind Franklin but then there are also many other examples where it shows that they are ignored in meetings they would be treated like a technician they are their competence is constantly questioned and so much so that imposter syndrome is so prevalent family leave is stigmatized people are kind of thinking about if they're pregnant women are really worried about like like maybe they might lose their job after that and these subtle exclusions are the things that actually are uh, hurting are they they're not just hurting women but they're hurting the humanity because again you are losing 50 percent of the workforce because of that now this is one part like the gender bias and this is one part but this is the other side of it which is visible minority which means again if you move to another country you're no longer in your own country you do face that additional uh, discrimination likely and more than 70 70 percent would be white and again when i'm saying that it is white men predominantly then there is a little proportion of white women and then it's all the other uh, other categories so yeah i do want to quote here that what is happening here is really pulling down women right so and I wanted to quote here uh, that line from uh, Melinda Gates' book, uh, The Moment of Lift, that because sometimes all that's needed to lift women is to stop pulling them down. So I think that is something that we need to do. Again, another evidence of the data. This is this was an experiment that was done, identical CVs with identical um, qualifications experience were sent out to the entire country. And it, this is again from US. and. Uh, or just the name was changed from John to Jennifer. And candid feedback was asked for all the for, for the candidates from a variety of different institutes. And female scored less on everything, competency, hireability, mentorship, starting salary. And uh, I don't think there's any explanation for that, but they did they 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 were smart. They came up with an explanation with something that's called implicit bias. <laughs> And what is that? What we don't think we think. It's unconscious. We didn't even know about it. Like there was a difference between uh, the, just the name, that nothing else was different. I couldn't give them exactly the same score or hire them at the same salary, but that's what it is. So this is what uh, is, is, is there. But again, I would not say that this is only for STEM. This is everywhere. So this is a general challenge that a working woman has to uh, has to suffer and has to go through and but there are people who really have been taking that leadership in 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 revolutionizing the change in in really having that introducing the culture of change or questioning the status quo and that is important that is important every time unless you question the change won't happen so this example of Dr. Nancy Hopkins, she's a very established, a very celebrated a professor at MIT. And she shared her story in, in the same movie, The Picture of Scientist. And you, you, so she, she was just needed to do science. She didn't want to be a troublemaker. And she, they, they needed, she needed space for the, her zebrafish experiments. And she literally had to struggle to get that facility, that space because she was just given like a much smaller space as compared to all her other male colleagues. And she had to really fight for it for all, several years to measuring the space inch by inch to really present the data. Because again, if you have the data, that it speaks for itself. So that's what she did. She did, and she just didn't do it herself. She actually then, you know, you start walking and then it starts making the, the, the whole uh, group with you. And she led that group and it revolutionized in MIT in 1994, I think. They actually produced a big, gigantic report that 
gave recommendations for how it should not be there, like why women are not allowed to do research. That's what they're hired for. That's what they need to uh, get rid of this, uh, you know, bias in the salary structure for male versus female for the same qualifications. So this is this is kind of what, the reason why I'm explaining is that there are those issues, but there are also th the passion to change, bring change is what is needed. So this is just a, the, the picture that I just saw recently made by a nine-year-old boy. And that was about uh, how his mother was a housewife, essentially doing like really ho housework, just considered as an unpaid work. And literally, uh, you know, he, he was tired of listening to that. So he made this picture showing like what all she's doing. And the statistics show that on an average, a woman is doing like more than seven hours of uh, household work, which is unpaid as compared to men who are likely doing maybe about just two hours. So if a woman in science, if a woman are, if wants to go for, to pursue her passion, she has to take this with her. But I think we, as women are, are built strong or stronger, I think. This is, we are already organized. We are already very um, multitasker. We are the person, we are more organized, multitasker, time management. So that's why I think all of these skills together make us already very ready to take any kind of uh, challenge that may come across us. And, you know, it's not just, uh, it, 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 it takes time for people to bring in that change. And there are several societies, like one of the societies I'm associated with, Society for Canadian Women in Science and Technology, they, they work together in really advocate, advocacy and bringing you know, those, those, those uh, differences to the surface. Some of those things that are really hidden and just shushed that, oh, you know, it doesn't happen. They, are, they, they talk about it and they bring in those opportunities for women to really be comfortable and speak about it. And again, you know, this is another very uh, relevant line. And I think this, this makes sense that as women gains right, rights to really pursue their dreams, I mean, families flourish and the societies flourish. And that is uh, the gender equality would lift everyone. All right, so we have talked enough about those gaps. Let's go to the fun part of science and the STEM. And the biggest, biggest, biggest advantage, which I want to, uh, again advocate for for every each one of you whether it's a boy or a girl i again i i don't believe that when we are talking about women uh, or like the equality i'm just not saying that oh push men aside no i'm not saying that i'm saying stem is good for everybody because there are enormous choices and especially like i'm not even talking about the conventional stem careers that uh, I grew up with, like, yes, we could be doctors, engineers, and teachers, and veterinarians, or computer scientists, or or, or uh, the engineers, and like uh, construction workers. So there are a whole lot of, like a plethora of new careers that have been uh, coming in. And the reason is because of the interdisciplinary STEM crosstalk. There is a data world. People are imagining of making the, the, the flying cars are there. People are going to Mars. I mean, very sure. I, I'm very hopeful in my lifetime, I would be hearing about that. And there are the solar cities. And, you know, you talk about chemistry and uh, physics together, and there is another field. You talk about engineering and the biology, and you get to bionics, and you're really developing prosthetics. You could be in defense doing research. You could be doing advanced uh, medical technologies and really changing the world, right? I don't even have uh, enough, you know, like space that I could really uh, list out the number of uh, uh, science careers or the STEM careers that you can have. But I'm just kind of listing a couple of them, which have been uh, very interesting. I mean, to me, I felt like, oh, there you could, you, when you're a medical science liaison, you're working really with the science and the medical, and you are all, you could be the regulatory affairs specialist, where, which, where, which means that you have a little bit of knowledge of, uh, you are pharmacologist, but you're also the person who's likely going to be approving the drugs and you're in the legal affairs as well. You could be in science diplomacy. So you're a scientist and a diplomat and you are working to change the world. Like we are literally talking about being a diplomat in, 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 and, and making, uh, making big decisions for the country. 
You could be a stock investor. Yes, there are people who are uh, advisory or who are on advisory board and they're scientists. They are advising people to which stocks to buy, which vaccine is going to work, which biotech industry is booming, where. So all of these. And again, like if it's not just the science, but then the math comes in, you know, from the STEM field and you could be a statistician, you could be an economist, artificial intelligence and all of these fields are making it uh, absolutely like uh, unstoppable really unstoppable you there is really nothing like i mean you can be an author if you really want to be an author you can be an author there are new york best selling authors for from science from stem field as well science communication has been uh, a very age old now career as well i'm not just talking about these i'm also talking about entertainment like one of the uh, earlier talks I was hearing as well about happiness. I mean, we these careers do bring happiness, right? And when we are talking about entertainment, I'm talking about that little like button on Facebook or just Facebook, TikTok, all, all of these things are driven by people. So there is I mean, I could literally, you know, I wish I had some kind of uh, like a poll system of doing like, you know, give you, giving you a challenge, like, okay, give me a career that probably you would think that is not possible because the crosstalk of science is so much there that you might be easily able to navigate uh, around it. And again, the rewards to be in STEM continue. You're always in a better funding environment. When I'm saying better funding environment, please excuse me. I'm not saying that you have better funding opportunities because yes, science does have, uh, you know, when there are a big crisis, people start pouring money in science. But other than that, like it does have a little bit of lesser sometimes. I mean, it gets a little bit lesser overlooked, but I'm talking more about the, the salary structure. So you are always thinking about multiple job options. You're talking about better salary than an average non-STEM person. STEM education is definitely having that is going to be good for planet and good for environment. You're going to make much better decisions for, for our planet and even for the entire universe. You're going to make better decisions for your family, whether it's health uh, status, how like vaccination, family planning, or uh, any of that. And again, that's all going to make better foundation. There's, it's going to be better for society, better economy. I mean, there's a, there was a data I, I missed to quote here, but I think it just said that how if everybody, like women, men together, they are together in the STEM, it is going to make any economy very easily and very swiftly to a, like way more than a trillion economy. So, you know, there is that scope. And what we need to do is we need to really come together and bring in the power of that change that can br that can bring that equity and uh, include everybody and progress. And of course, uh, being a being a STEM, you are always going to be much better at logic, reasoning, troubleshooting. All of this comes very handy at home and in your personal personal uh, life skill, right? Like these are life skills as well. Of course, we are here today to celebrate women in STEM, and I want to. Uh, again, these are not by no means just some like uh, all the examples, but these are some of the examples that I was thinking like, you know, nowadays we don't have lack of role model in STEM. We have so many to choose from and I, I deliberately choose a lot from India as well because I, I feel connected. I still feel very connected all, all the time. I'm looking back and what's happening. And, uh, you know, whether it's, uh, and I try to choose from different fields of STEM, whether it's the nuclear scientist or whether it's our missile lady or whether it's a, it's a biotech boob, like, or somebody who revolutionized the test tube babies or twice uh, Nobel Prize winner, Madame Curie, or the recent one, um, of our, uh, our uh, Emmanuel and, uh, um, what's her name? Sorry, I forgot. <laughs> it's just uh, blanked out, Emmanuel and, Jennifer, yes, for uh, CRISPR, the the fastest ever uh, Nobel Prize uh, being recognized. And this was like first women of color. Remember that one in the whole chart? <laughs> She's one who, who had that. And uh, yes, yeah, so there are, and of course, Rosalind, even though the work was not recognized, but I think she still stays as an inspiration for many, many people in STEM. And um, I'm sure if, uh, you know, we, they, they continue, we continue to keep taking their lead and uh, really bring that change in, in the mindset.
coming to changing the mindset. I think STEM is the closest thing that can make you equivalent to a superhero. I mean, last year, COVID-19 was the year of fight between superheroes, STEM superheroes, and COVID-19. Now, again, I can go with any of these examples, like whether we are talking about the science, whether we are talking about the medical team, or we are talking about the scientists in that side as well, whether we are talking about engineers who were building uh, better technologies or uh, sterilization methods or engineered controls for uh, saving people and the medical staff, or we are talking about more uh, the technical gadgets that are now being made to sterilize the surfaces, or we are talking about the computational data that was helping to model the population, uh, the epidemiology of the, the different strains, or to find the best epitope or the best uh, structure uh, using the computer modeling for the vaccine research. It was all our STEM superheroes. Okay, so I don't I think that that is enough evidence. I mean, this was one of the things which we, as 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 young kids, like I mean, we used to have those um, things like what, like are superheroes real? Like definitely, definitely nowadays we can say that because STEM has been so much more popular. All right, so I think yeah, with next uh, generation STEM leaders, I think some of the things which I would like to say, uh, and especially because I think back like more than 10 years ago like if I when I came here I, I I kind of went on my own journey but I felt like you know some of those things I uh, want to uh, advise to the next generation STEM people like remember how I said in my childhood we had so many uh, I mean my parents did a lot to engage me in the in in the curiosity and kind of keep me in 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 the STEM zone all the time I think these days i empathize with parents i mean i'm myself a parent of two kids but and i know how difficult it is because of the digital exposure that everybody has that it's hard to ask a kid to do something you know making those sugar crystals or some of those things then they have so much uh, digital exposure but at the same time the positive side is that you have so much so much so much to learn now i, I remember in the previous talk uh, talking about you know learning r or learning coding Coding is now literally like, uh, you know, I've seen four-year, five-year-old kids also getting enrolled. I mean, we have those spring camps, summer camp, so much digital uh, online. Like last year, COVID was exceptionally learning year for, I think, many people. Uh, and I, I literally heard that there were so many, the, the online registration of the courses and everything, like, was all-time high. And I, I feel so happy because this is an opportunity for people to learn and that is making entire like all the learning opportunities are becoming so much more accessible so i would advise all the parents who are listening and also all you stem leaders that learn enroll in in any of these courses i mean online just enroll in the google school of learning and you being researchers you being really smart people you will get to learn so much more you will get to learn so much of these things much faster a any of that is possible because how you have wired yourself as being a, one of a STEM person, you're able to do that very easily. And I'm telling by my own, own experience, I mean, I had absolutely no idea of uh, so many things and I, I continue to keep doing and learning. The second thing I would suggest is to volunteer and do some internships. And that's something which is, uh, I believe is, is a very, very good way of exposing yourself to different things. I mean, I know myself, like, you know, when I was in PhD, like I really went from my BSc to master's to PhD and, you know, and I was getting like scholarship to go further. So I was literally not looking around, but I, I did learn quite a bit. And now if I have to go back, I can think about it like, okay, maybe I would have benefited if I had done like a lab rotation. Maybe I like that lab better. Maybe I like that research better. And I think that was something that if I knew, if I, somebody would have really pushed me, I would have easily gone into that. I mean, I'm telling my daughters all the time to volunteer here or volunteer there and learn this or learn that because I just want them to make an informed decision, informed choice for themselves. And the only way to do that is to get out and learn and know from people. And la this, the other part about holistic development, I think this is an important uh, part because you can get the best out of your STEM skills if you also uh, focus and develop your non-STEM skills, like your really your personal development, really learning, listening to yourself, like finding your passion, what your passion is, 
invest some time in business skills, invest some time in communication skills, networking, collaboration, all of these are important. These are not somebody, nobody teaches you ever. Nobody says that, oh, you need to go out for so-and-so collaboration event or networking event, but you need to go out yourself and you have to find those connections from make those relationship connections and build those that that strong network for yourself so that you are taking the best benefit out of your STEM. And then you are really unstoppable. And But I think I still want to, I don't want to stop there. I still want to say that once you are reaching there, the magic can happen. But what you need to do is, you need to make sure that you are responsible for the next generation. Don't just go on your own path. Take somebody with you, mentor somebody, because that's what is gonna change the world, really. Because once you start joining hands, that's when the new world really comes. And I am not sure if I will be able to uh, share the audio of this video, but I will try. But yeah, if I don't, then I think I would suggest you all to watch this video once. And by, I would just say that you have a lot of discovery to do and all sort of things can happen when you're open to new ideas and playing around with things. And I will try to play this and let me know if you can not hear the video. I mean, if you, yeah. Oops. Uh, Ma'am, sorry to interrupt, but uh, we don't have any audio of this video. We are not able to hear any voice. Okay, never mind then. Uh, I think uh, I will you just... can share us the link, and we'll share it share it with the participants and everybody. Okay, sure. I think I can do that then. Uh, all right, then I think I will share the link. And uh, finally, I would just like to thank everybody uh, who who helped me all through this journey. That includes my parents, my family, my, my kids now as well, and uh, all the mentors on the way, the students on the way who also, there was, had always been a two-way learning. And I think again, that has made me believe that it needs a village to bring change and we need to join hands, advocate for the next generation. And then you go STEM, okay? Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, right. Can you please share the link in the Google Meet chat? Yes, I am looking at it. I uh, did I am I sharing my screen still? No, I'm not, not now. OK, OK, I will uh, send the link just a minute. OK, I'm just finding because if I'm sharing my screen, I can't uh, do that. OK. All right. And this is the link. Yeah. OK. Thank you, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, we'll give it to the, we'll make it available to the participants. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. So, thank you, ma'am, for presenting such an intriguing lecture to our participants and also explaining the status of women graphically in STEM and also explaining the STEM careers and jobs to our participants. Uh, ma'am, yes, ma please. Thank you, Dr. Vidhu, for uh, sharing your own and so many other diverse, exciting, unstoppable STEM journey of women. And of course, uh, showing the career paths, encouraging learning and volunteering, even in these difficult times to improve one's skills. So I'm sure it's a lot of motivation to our students and many women out there. Thank you very much. Not a problem. And thank you so much for giving this opportunity opportunity i i think i'm 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 really open to any questions if anybody has 
Um, so uh, as of now, the participants are just uh, like really thanking you for delivering such a intriguing lecture, ma'am. Right. <laughs> okay. Great. So yeah. So thank you, ma'am, and thank you, everybody. So with this, we yeah, have yes. this one one question in YouTube. If you could read out, please, by Anurekha Sharma. Sharma. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so she said that uh, gender bias is uh, still there in many universities located in smaller cities. More of it is because many women endorse that physical science and uh, English doesn't allow time for family and is male dominant. Absolutely. So, yes, and absolutely. And again, I think uh, there are several things, you know, again, it would never be just one person making a change. That's why I say that we need to build the chain of people. But the change happen only when one person starts questioning. And that is when that is the beginning. That is really one of the beginning of you say no to it. You say and again, you know, I can share if I have do I have some time? I, I can share an example from uh, a recent book that I was reading, uh, The Moment of Lift from uh, Melinda Gates. And uh, it was a very nice story, which I felt like it was very powerful. And I think it could be worth sharing with everybody. And that was about how a girl who, uh, like a woman who had like a dying child, was not allowed to take her child to the hospital because she had to stay there for two weeks for all the treatment and you know die, she was dying of uh, malnutrition and they she was not allowed because for two weeks who's going to do the housework that was that was it but then how she really said no to it she said that okay i can be i am the person who's doing all the housework all the time but i am this is right now my priority and I think that is what changes. Like, you know, once you start questioning, other people would start listening to you and other people will start joining you. So as I said, like, you know, there are so many organizations right now and especially also in India as well and many other countries where uh, there has been, like it is now a gen like a, an evidence-based, uh, you know, really there is data-driven uh, result that nobody can deny. Yes, they can say it's unconscious, but it is there. People know that there is, it's not yet clear that uh, w w that there is a bias like it, uh, until now but now people can't say that because the data is there so all over it is evident now what we need to do is to really bring those voices together advocate for each other be supportive to each other not be uh, you know uh, an obstacle in 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 our way in others way like bring more women together like one of the things that i remember and i think uh, i heard in the previous conversation of how it feels really lonely if you are the only one receiving an award how it just feels really at that time i also used to feel very special like oh i'm the i'm the person i'm the i'm the star here but i regret sometimes uh you know that time i was enjoying i should have been questioning like where are other women why uh, why am i the only one here so i think that's that's what is important to for us to realize and actually question that if i if we see that something is odd just stay back and question and i think that's when you start building those voices together and bring the change so thank you ma'am for uh, explaining it um, and um, as you just shared the link with us, so we will be playing it on our YouTube channel in the video right away. So just a sure. minute, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, also to mention, ma'am, that uh, the movie you mentioned, uh, Gitanjali ma'am also have mentioned a movie to all girls and women that is uh, misbehavior that uh, that all participants and all girls and women should, uh, you know, see it. And I would also like to thank Gitanjali ma'am for sharing this with us.
Just a few seconds, uh, we are uploading the video. People that are outstanding did not become great overnight. They had to discipline themselves. I'm very proud to have been people that are outstanding they did not become great overnight they had to discipline themselves I'm very proud to have been the person in charge of launching the Chandra X-ray Observatory. Engineering gives you a method of making science happen. Mars is one of the most interesting planets in the solar system to study because it has so many similarities to the Earth. As long as you've done your best to be ready, then you are ready. Because I was being so very, very thorough and checking everything out, that's how I stumbled across pulsars. I want to be a scientist. I'm going to get there. I need to keep trying. I actually had a fight to get to do science at high school. We have booster ignition and liftoff of Columbia, reaching new heights for women in X-ray astronomy. You have a lot of discovering to do. This is my time to win. So thank you, ma'am, and thank you, everybody. So with this, we end our first half of the symposium here, and we will resume after the break at 3 p.m. IST. Let's take a short break and come back. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am.